My, uh, my talk this afternoon in some ways uh, continues the uh, discussion that we had this morning with Lawrence Parker's very uh, interesting, very good discussion on that uh, significant phrase, the damning phrase from the, the Communist Manifesto. And uh, in many ways, the discussion we had there about the nature of the Labour Party and about the relationship of communists to the wider Labour movement um, really sort of chimes in with uh, what I want to talk about today. Um, just to, on, in terms of the title, the, the title is long, but I think it does contain a number of significant phrases. And uh, I thought about the, both the meanings of the words quite clearly, and uh, in a way, I'd like to sort of pull those words out and, and base my contribution around them. Uh, first of all, is the idea of labor as a vehicle for socialism, not an instrument and not actually a socialist party, but uh, a vehicle as a, as a factor that has to be taken into account as well. And again, I think that came out very well this morning. But also the, uh, the idea of the nature of the transformation of labor and uh, in particular what sort of party labor is and what sort of party it might become both through the conscious actions of Marxists and the creation of a Marxist party but also through uh, the wider political social and economic change in capitalist society and of course, the, the key question, which is one of the main themes of the, uh, the Communist University, is the, the role and the importance of a communist party, and in particular, a hegemonic communist party. And I hope that uh, I can introduce some of those themes here, but also uh, during the course of the discussion, that they will be drawn out. Um, so uh, obviously, key issues of revolutionary strategy uh, 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 raised here, but also I think these are linked with our conception of uh, socialism, in particular the distinction between Marxism as the idea of the self-emancipation of the working class and the idea of parliamentary socialism, and in particular the relationship of uh, existing institutions and parties to that struggle. That obviously then raises the question of uh, if we are if we're campaigning if we're help fighting for a party that will um, uh, enable the self emancipation of the working class working class and general human liberation that brings the question about how we raise that consciousness how we develop that majority again something that has come out in in previous sessions. And in particular, what we mean by revolutionary consciousness, particularly the debates around uh, the minimum and maximum program, and of course the, the issue of transitional demands and, and how we raise the level, how we raise these ideas of uh, transforming society and how we win a majority in the working class. And that of course then raises the, the nature of the Labour Party and as, uh, as, as came out so well this morning, not just labor as a structure, but also of laborism, what we, we mean by that, and particularly the phrase I enjoyed this morning, the congenital uh, laborism of many people on the labor left. And uh, just by way of parentheses here, I'm, uh, I'm recovering from that particular illness, had it for quite a long time, but uh, I'm, I hope that uh, this is an important stage in my recovery. And likewise, the, uh, the, the nature of a communist party uh, and its strategy, and what I see as its indispensable role, both in any transformation of politics within uh, the Labour Party and the wi and wider society. And of course, perhaps just as important lurking behind all of these questions is how we characterize uh, our period, you know, to, to kind of phrase through what's, which stage are we passing? Um, and whether we're in uh, a, you know, a distinctly different period, whether, for example, the arguments and the policies and the programs of the past still have relevance for Marxists. And you know, one, one of the important themes, I think, in this university is our relationship to that history and what we can learn, but also uh, what we might need to uh, look at again in terms of both strategy and program. 
So uh, I want to begin, first of all, with the idea of labour as a vehicle for socialism. And uh, both this morning and in other sessions, we've talked about the history and the nature of the, uh, the Labour Party. And indeed, uh, in my, uh, my role as a member of the Labour Party Marxist Steering Group, and indeed my, my role in various uh, Labour left organisations, we've talked about the, the nature of Labour as a bourgeois workers' party. And this, uh, this phrase drawn from Lenin, and in particular discussed in some detail in the, in the pamphlet, uh, um, Left Wing Communism, an infantile disorder, um, I think is, is well known. But I think we need to be clear exactly what Lenin means by that, and in particular, in some ways, how that, that characterization has in, in many ways been reinforced by the history of the Labour Party over the last 100 years. The Labour Party that Lenin and uh, the uh, British communists in, in the early 1920s were discussing was in many ways, um, already set on its current path of being a bourgeois party, of being part of the established capitalist and parliamentary constitutional order. In fact, we might even argue that uh, that was always implicit in the forms of lib labism that uh, had developed in the 19th century, and in particular with the, the, the relationship between labor as a parliamentary party, as a representation of working class interests of labor, simply a representational party in parliament, that, that that idea of labor having its place in capitalist society had been pretty well established. But I think that many of the, uh, the bourgeois links that we talk about uh, have in fact been deepened. And uh, in a real sense now, labor is uh, an integral part of the capitalist system both uh, in terms of the personnel of its leadership, but also of its structures. At all levels of uh, British society, uh, Labour is represented as a political force, uh, whether that be in local government and in the, in the central institutions of the state, in the law, and indeed in the whole apparatus of the capital state. So Labour's place within that system is assured. Um, that was beginning, obviously, before the First World War, when, when Labour politicians and Labour officials were taking control of local government, but also many of them were becoming uh, integrated into the state uh, bureaucracy and the, and the officials. And of course, serving in the uh, wartime cabinet in 1914-18, uh, uh, um, Labour uh, cabinet ministers uh, took part in the war effort and um, Although we often focus on the splits in German social democracy uh, around the time of the Borgfrieden, um, we have similar uh, disputes and, dis, uh, and, and experiences, not quite as profound, but in the role of, the, um, of Labour ministers, uh, Arthur Henderson, for example, serving in the cabinet, and just as a, uh, one element of this, not only participating in an imperialist war, but actually participating in the execution of uh, a revolutionary uh, Irish socialist, James Connolly, and indeed participating fully in the, in the war effort in that way. The role of many of the union leaders in uh, strengthening the war effort, and in, then the revolt of many of their rank and file through the revolutionary uh, movements, the shop stewards committees, the rent strikes, and so on. So Labour's, Labour's, uh, Labour's role as a bourgeois party was already well underway at the time that Lenin wrote about um, uh, British Labourism in, um, in left-wing communism. In many ways, though, um, the British Labour Party is uh, quite a unique institution, and Lenin went to great lengths to explain that to the two left communists and to those critics of an orientation towards the Labour Party. He pointed out the history of the party about its relationship with the organized working class through the trade unions. And indeed he talked, I suppose, in the broader sense about the role of British trade unions in, uh, in bourgeois politics. 
So given, given the nature of that, given uh, the, the historical role of labor in, um, in British society, um, we, we can see the tendencies as uh, really accelerating. And of course, as the 20th century wore on, um, these became become much more uh, pronounced. Indeed, we might argue that uh, the 45-51 Labour government, which uh, I'll look at in a, a while, in some senses established uh, a type of laborist uh, consensus, which is going to be dominant in the period 1945 into the late 1970s. And so in a sense, almost became part, a contribute to the official ideology of the, uh, of the British bourgeois state. So it, it is very clearly a bourgeois workers' party, and indeed the bourgeois elements are really very important indeed. Um, it also uh, proved itself uh, throughout the whole of that period to be a very reliable uh, second eleven. Um, Labour leaders not only participated in the normal running of the bourgeois state, but of course in wartime uh, they took their, their place. And likewise, in the, um, in the conduct of the British Empire, but also of decolonization and so on, um, a whole host of Labour leaders, comrades don't need to be reminded of, of who they are, all you know, contributed to the running of bourgeois society. But of course, um, our, uh, our interest in this party is not, is not simply to sort of criticize it as a bourgeois party. Our interest in it is the fact that it, it still commands the allegiance, uh, the electoral allegiance and a degree of political allegiance of millions of working class people. In other words, that as, uh, as communists who want to create a party and a movement that can transform society, labor is a factor. But it's more than a factor. It's, uh, it's not only part of the bourgeois state, but it's also in many senses a barrier in the form of its leadership, and I would argue in the form of its left wing to the creation of a socialist society, because its dual role as both a bourgeois and a workers party presents us both with problems and with opportunities. It, prevents us, it presents us with a, um, a party which claims to speak on behalf of the working class, claims to be able to um, bring gains for the working class. And above all, it, it poses as an alternative to revolutionary, uh, revolutionary struggle. Again, this morning's talk um, where uh, Lawrence was looking at, uh, at that relationship, I think uh, you know, brought that home very well. Um, above all, because of the existence of, of a significant labor left, and this, I think, is, uh, is, is, is going to be a key part of our discussion. Because of the existence of a, of a significant Labour left, um, it, re it represents a, a pole of attraction, particularly for those uh, groups of workers and those sections of society that are looking for, uh, for, at the very least, political change, and indeed, on occasions, looking for revolutionary and even trans transformation and even revolutionary uh, politics. Now, Lawrence made the very important point this morning that one of the main characteristics of the Labour left is its relationship to the right and the centre. And uh, the phrase, it's congenital reformism, the, con the phrase about unity and about Labourism, I think is the key to this. And that I think in many ways comes from the underlying perspectives of the Labour left. Now, the Labour left, in the course of the, the 100 or so years, 120 or so years, has taken on many forms. And um, it would be a mistake in many senses to see the, the Labour left as, as a simply one form throughout its history. Um, in, uh, in, in a review uh, in the Weekly Worker a few years ago now of Simon Hanna's book, on the Labour left, I think it was called a party with socialists in it, this point was very well made. So there's a very clear difference, for example, from the Labour left um, of the national left-wing movement 
um, that was uh, you know, very closely influenced by the, the Communist Party of Great Britain in the, in the late 1920s, or the Labour left that was, influ that was similarly influenced in the late 30s or in the 1940s and 50s. That's, uh, that's clearly a very different Labour left than say the Labour left that emerges in the 1970s, um, partly as a reaction to the Wilson government, but also as a reflection of many of the industrial struggles of that period. And um, uh, again, that left is, is, does have within it uh, certain elements that, that are influenced by new leftism, by the, the various Trotskyist formations that are emerging, the very shop stewards movements and so forth. And, and likewise, that left in the 1980s will, will develop both uh, influenced by organized Trotskyism, but by what we might think of broadly as a Trotskyist common sense. And we can think of um, individuals who you know, fall into that, uh, into that category. Now, the point, the, the, my point about the different labor lefts is that I think we need to be very clear on on those distinctions, also on those historical periods. Um, it's very clear, for example, that with the, 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 the prestige of the Soviet Union, the strength of the Soviet Union, meant that for many people that was a, a, a pole of attraction. And indeed, it, it was very influential, I think, in uh, influencing uh, both the, the, the formal left in the parliamentary Labour Party but also uh, in the constituencies, um, people, you know, read the Morning Star before that, the Daily Worker. Um, they were they were very influenced, I think. And elements of left reformism uh, clearly reflected the uh, the British road to socialism. And indeed, that that argument of an anti-monopoly alliance involving uh, the Labour left and left wing governments and the Communist Party was a very influential uh, you know, strategic orientation. But there were, also, uh, there were also other elements here, which I think we need to, uh, need to think about. And that of course is the, uh, the role of the various organized Trotskyist tendencies. And again, uh, we, we looked at those in some detail this morning. So I won't revisit some of that, but I will, um, I will think, do think we need to look at it in terms of how we might characterize the labor left, but more importantly, how we can see the importance of, uh, of, of the idea of a communist party, a distinct organized communist party outside of the labor party and its relationship to, uh, to laborism. So if, we, if we've agreed that uh, labor is a bourgeois workers party, that it does um, have the, um, it does, it is clearly integrated in its leadership and in, in its senior echelons, and indeed even at quite lower levels into capitalist politics, into parliamentary politics, and indeed into aspects of the state. Um, then that will shape how we, we orient towards it. And that characterization of the Labour Party as a site of struggle, as a bourgeois workers' party, is one that many Trotskyist comrades. Uh, would have adopted, but let's look very closely at some of their um, some of their specific uh, specific demands. Uh, for example, the comrades in Socialist Appeal, who've recently been prescribed, um, have often talked about reclaiming labour. And if you read their uh, if you read their material, particularly their historical material, which appears quite frequently in their paper, Socialist Appeal they make great play on getting back to the origins of the party. They make great play uh, about their, their labor loyalism. And obviously that, that is part of their, um, their, their sort of ideological inheritance from the militant group, which had been uh, within the Labour Party um, uh, since the 1950s in some forms, clearly from the 1960s. And there, the rationale of those politics, I think, are not just um, uh, are not just a sort of congenital laborism. I think that what we have here is very much a product of post-war Trotskyism, and in many ways, the problem that all revolutionaries have faced 
certainly in the post-war world, and that is of the relative isolation, isolation and weakness of the revolutionary forces. Now, uh, Trotsky advised his followers at various stages in the 1930s to carry out a policy of entry, of going into particular parties that were moving to the left to recruit people, and then maybe to bring those people out into an open uh, organization. But uh, there was also another tactic, often um, pejoratively described as Pabloism, of so-called deep entry. And this was, I suppose, a recognition that in the post-war world, we were in for almost a long, a, a very long march through the institutions. And in the case of some, uh, of some people who went in for deep entry, that long march may well have lasted 50, 60 plus years. Uh, you know, a very long march indeed. Now, what this resulted in, I think, uh, in an attempt to recruit, in an attempt to win over the masses, uh, as it was seen, was in many ways a sort of idealization of, uh, of laborism. So there was a contradiction. In many ways, politics were framed in, in terms of labor loyalism, reclaim labor, get it back to its roots overcome the betrayals of the leadership. But it was also argued that those sorts of politics of, of deep entry and indeed of the, um, uh, of the demand, for example, to elect a Labour government committed to socialist politics or social, a socialist program, that this would expose reformism. That in a sense, you would, you would say to the reformists, you believe in a parliamentary road, you believe that uh, socialism can be achieved uh, in this way. Well, you know, prove it, do it. And in that, in that sense, you're putting demands on the labor, um, on the um, on the labor leadership. Now, that uh, that type of politics was, uh, I suppose, fairly commonplace, and socialists feel still posing in those terms. But what I think it fails to do. Uh, you know, very clearly is to explain the nature of labor and its very contradictory nature. And it, it in particular obscures the history of the Labour Party and the, the accurate description of it as a bourgeois workers' party. And socialist appeal in particular, uh, by playing the, the Labour loyalist card of being more Labour than Labour and arguing that it's the leadership who are, in a sense, the infiltrators and so forth. They obscure, I think, their own Marxism, they, you know, and they, the comrades do define themselves in that way. They obscure any commitment to Marxism and just really present themselves as super labor lefts in that way. So our arguments here are not, not, essentially, uh, not essentially about that. Our arguments in terms of an instrument, uh, uh, sorry, our arguments in terms of a vehicle are, are not essentially about labor as an instrument. Uh, they're, they're, they're posed in a very different way as well. The other, uh, the other problem I think with this, this type of uh, laborism is not only um, that it idealizes labor uh, and again goes back to a mythical golden age, but in a sense it locates Marxist politics. If, you know, if, these, if we accept that these comrades are Marxist or we take their own assessment of face value. It, ex it locates those politics less in the form of real transformation and more just a sort of slightly more left, a slightly more radical uh, element of laborism. And I think we can see this in, the, in terms of the idealization of 1945, the 1945 government. And above all, I think the, the, the links to that type of uh, wartime nostalgia and a sense that, uh, that labor is, is a central part of British society. But from their point of view, we need to extend laborism. We need to push it further to the left in that way. In other words, um, we as Marxists, these comrades seem to suggest, we're not beyond the pale. We're not foreigners. We're not really very different. We're just you know, good old laborists who really just want to stand up for the working class. And I think that this is, is really part of a process of legitimation. And indeed, it, it just places their politics 
on very much a conventional spectrum. spectrum. So instead of arguing for any form of real transformation, and above all, of, of really contesting the, the, the leadership of, of the working class with, um, with reformists and indeed with the out and out pro-capitalists, this I think always pulls its punches. Because like, um, like the point of the mainstream labor left, as, um, as those who are committed to parliamentary uh, socialism uh, through the par the, a parliamentary transformation, it turns essentially upon maintaining the unity uh, with the right of maintaining the unity of the party. And in terms of the, uh, in terms of the major left reformists of the sort that we've seen in the last few years, that means endless compromises and, um, and capitulations. And indeed the experience of, uh, of Corbynism and indeed its nature as a mass force within the party reveals those weaknesses very, very clearly. Um, I, um, I spent a lot of time in the last four or five years within that, that milieu. And one of the, one of the things that uh, was very apparent to me was that, uh, that even the best of the left saw labor as uh, essentially a vehicle um, uh, that did not require any form of transformation. They saw it as a ready-made instrument, that it was just a case of getting good people into position. It wasn't uh, really very much about program. It wasn't really much about how the party should organize itself. And that to me was, was very sort of redolent of, of, of these forms of laborism. Likewise, um, it's nostalgia for the past, it's nostalgia for Bevanism or for Benism. All of these, this sort of focus on, on leadership, on betrayal, and just the importance of getting good people into, uh, into position. We know that, for example, Corbyn's own politics were an illustration of this. Uh, Corbyn's refusal to fight the right wing, to you know, decisively carry out a remodeling of the party, any form whatsoever, uh, any sort of democratization, or any defense of, of people on the left. Um, you know, comrades were expelled, comrades were uh, you know, traduced, uh, vilified in the media and so on. And even people very close to uh, Corbyn were in the phrase thrown under the bus. And, um, and, and we, we, we can see what the, you know, what the impact of that is. So this is not, I think, just a personal weakness of, of, of Corbyn. In many ways, Corbyn um, is, I think, representative of, uh, of, of Labour leftism, and he's representative in, in many ways of the current that, that came into the Labour Party to support him, but then in a sense had no perspective about what to do, where to take that. And that was because I think of the congenital Labourism, the idea that Labour could, could simply be used ready-made in that way. Now, the other, uh, the other issue I want to bring into the discussion, particularly around uh, the ideas of Labour as a vehicle for socialism, in particular its transformation, is something of the current debates about the, um, uh, about the future of Labour and indeed uh, how far it will be shifted into a, a qualitatively different party under Starmer. Um, this morning, uh, some comrades talked about let the existence of Labour as almost a sort of an eternal fact of nature that, you know, like the poor, you should always have laborism with you. And that uh, it's, uh, you know, like the trees, uh, although in the time of climate change, perhaps we shouldn't maybe use that analogy, but that essentially there, there will always be a labor party. Now, it's very clear that labor does have these very deep roots in British society. It has deep roots in the working class organizations. Although those working class organizations are in many ways a lot weaker than would have been the case 30 or 40 years ago. And um, its position in British society could also uh, suffer severe blows. The, the experience of labor in Scotland, um, I think shouldn't be, shouldn't be ignored. So um, 
we shouldn't uh, simply see labor as eternal. We shouldn't, for example, uh, not, um, not be aware that the, um, the type of uh, decline that we've seen in, in the left in other European countries, the decline of the large communist parties in, in Italy and in France, uh, the, the, the weakness of the SPD in Germany, all of these might point to uh, some, of the, uh, some of the risks of taking that sort of approach towards laborism in that way. We also, uh, we also shouldn't underestimate uh, Starmer's uh, desires for electoral success and his willingness to, uh, to lead labor further down a uh, sort of delaborized road. Um, the, the coming conference, I think, will be significant there. Um, it's very clear that the ritual sacrifices that we've seen at sections of the left fit into that, um, that type of strategy. But it may also be um, that he might, you know, carry out more fundamental changes, both in the organizational form of the party, um, in terms of the relationship between the leadership and the membership, um, you know, having, in a sense, burnt their fingers with, um, with the Corbyn movement, they might want to try and prevent a, a repetition of that in some ways. And of course, the relationship with the trade unions, uh, which in many ways is the bedrock of, of arguments about uh, the, uh, the nature of Labour as a, as a bourgeois workers' party. Um, again, these will all turn on many um, accidental and epi episodic factors, whether Jared Coyne is elected to unite, uh, the relative balance of forces within the union, so on and so on. But the, the key point is that um, as it stands, Labour does remain uh, a site of struggle. Um, but we should not, I think, just simply see it as, um, as an eternal form. Neither should we, I think, and again, this reflects some of the discussions uh, on the Labour left, particularly those elements of it that um, may well have their origins in the revolutionary left. We shouldn't also, though, simply see that um, now is the time to abandon that particular form of struggle. Um, again, some comrades, you know, bizarrely or maybe not bizarrely, maybe it's inherent in their politics, have swung from sort of auto-laborism to now um, leaving labor at the first opportunity of arguing that, that labor is finished. And again, comrades will be aware of those sorts of discussions, the arguments about establishing uh, a broad left party um, in the phrase of one comrade, uh, the need for a broad left party with a Marxist vanguard, um, so you can see they're very, a very contradictory formation. In other words, the replication of the Labour left, but outside of, of Labour, or uh, simply um, a la the, uh, the Socialist Party and their trade union and uh, Socialist Coalition, a, a, a Labour Party Mark II of simply establishing some coalition outside of Labour of the, of the Labour left with elements of the trade unions. What's missing from both comrades here, I think uh, both uh, type sets of comrades, is really the, the idea of a, of a hegemonic communist party, a very clear Marxist party. They all, in a sense, tend to reproduce forms of laborism outside. And that, I think, is, is because the politics of these comrades, like many uh, people on the labor left, their politics really turn on, I suppose, a lack of confidence, but also um, a lack of belief or a lack of perspective that it's possible to win the working class to uh, a Marxist and a communist program. In other words, there is a, a, a degree of concession to capitalism, a degree of concession, in some cases, a considerable degree of concession to reformism. And that I think really flows from their, uh, their unwillingness, their inability, their, their lack of perspective in the ability of, uh, of Marxists to win uh, a majority in the working class. In other words, to create a Marxist party, which is of course uh, our main uh, objective. Now, why I think we, we need to bring together 
the, the idea of the Marxist party, the communist party, and the nature of the Labour Party is not simply that the communist party is absolutely essential for uh, carrying out the socialist uh, transformation uh, in Britain or indeed in, uh, elsewhere. We need, we need those sorts of movements internationally. And that's because of both the structural and the ideolog ideological weaknesses and the ideological and structural barriers that reformism uh, throws up, that we cannot simply take those, uh, those parties and those instruments ready-made, just as in the same way we can't take the state ready-made and use it to transform society. But we need, I think, to link the struggle in the Labour Party to the struggle to build a communist party. And that's why the, the, in, in the opening uh, phrase about a hegemonic communist party and uh, the, the struggle within labor are in, in effect in, inextricably linked. In that sense, we are in very similar position to that of the, the early British communists and the, the sorts of debates that were going on um, in 1920 uh, and, uh, and so on. The demands that the, the, the LPM comrades have been putting forward is for the transformation of labor into a united front of a special kind, a permanent united front. And in one way, uh, there are very clear historical precedents from that, and that is to return uh, labor to the form that it had before 1918. 1918 is, is well known as the, uh, the, the year in which Clause 4 was introduced, the Fabian uh, document that was in, in many ways an attempt to sideline revolutionary politics and the influence of the Russian Revolution into a form of state ownership and Fabian uh, top-down socialism, managerial socialism. In other words, it was a reinforcement of those elements of laborism and bureaucracy that linked British labor to the capitalist state. So although, although many comrades on the left hold this out to be some sort of model and some sort of beacon, and indeed it does reflect the pressures of the Russian Revolution, it was really an attempt to shore up and consolidate the, the role of the of the, bureau, the trade union bureaucracies and the parliamentary party at the expense of the left, albeit dressed in, uh, in, in rather left language, rather obscure language, but uh, you know, it, still had, it still has that, um, you know, that aim. But the, perhaps the more, more significant thing for our demands is that the nature of labor was changed from uh, a form of united front with different affiliations and different currents and tendencies. Again, the comrades referred to this this morning in relation to the British Socialist Party, the Independent Labour Party, Fabians, and so on and so on, to change it into an individual membership party. And in some ways, what that did was to destroy the idea of the party as the party of the whole labour movement and to turn it then into a very narrowly defined, clearly, explicitly reformist party. So that then enabled um, the leadership to issue bans and prescriptions. It enabled them to ideologically police the party. And as we saw in the 1920s with the, the battles for communist affiliation, for the expulsion of communists, uh, for the attempts to limit that, that clearly narrowed the terrain. So our demand for the, in, and this is I think now particularly uh, appropriate in terms of the reintroduction of prescriptions, our demand for the um, ending of bans and prescriptions is I think quite crucial because what it does is to overcome this idea of labor loyalism. We overcome the idea that we we're all labor loyalists and that uh, we are, we, we might have some left-wing ideas, but we're not, we're not seriously organizing, which as uh, comrades have said earlier, is really a bit of an insult to anybody's intelligence. You know, newspapers don't just appear uh, out of thin air and um, there, there may well be bodies of support, 
but uh, motions don't get onto the conference agenda simply because uh, all, a whole number of people miraculously think the same formulations at the same time. No, we're, we're quite open about organizing tendencies. We, we, we actually believe that that is a, a valuable and an important thing, open factions, uh, freedom of discussion and so on. So the, the, the idea of the refoundation of labor as a, uh, a united front of the working class, which allows all working class tendencies and parties to affiliate, is in a sense returning uh, labor back to that, uh, that structure that it had, but it also opens up the question of the nature of struggle it actually opens up labor then becoming an openly clear uh, site of struggle, making what is at the moment subterranean, what at the moment is ruled out organizationally, now placing that on the center of the agenda. And in that way, we, we, we get over, I think, uh, you know, auto laborism, that labor loyalism. Uh, what we, we now say is that we are we are part of the, the, the labor movement, we're part of the labor party to argue for, for Marxism, for a Marxist program. And we, we see that then as, as a central battleground, which is why uh, LPM comrades are not arguing for comrades to leave the labor party, but to stay and fight. But the point I suppose about this um, uh, relationship that is framed in the opening uh, title is that we cannot just simply have uh, Marxists within the Labour Party. The structures of the Labour Party as it is currently constituted uh, don't allow full discussion and full organization. And although we fight for them, they're still very restricted. But above all, we need an independent working class communist party external to Labour, because that will act as both a pole of attraction but also it is the only real vehicle that uh, we can uh, develop to uh, achieve the Marxist program. Such a party will aim for the hegemony of the working class movement. We're fighting for majority, we're fighting to build a majority for a revolutionary Marxist program. And that has to be distinct from laborism historically and in its contemporary sense. Without that, um, without that, we remain uh, simply a pressure group within a reformist movement. We need to link the two things together. If, if there is a, an open communist party with a clear program in this way, then it should affiliate. And it should affiliate uh, in, in the way that Lenin argued as a way of winning more workers, particularly the organized workers, and those in the, in the Labour Party who are moving to the left. But it should be a very, a very clearly organized party that argues that Labour as it's presently constituted is both a reformist party, it's a bourgeois workers party, but that without, without struggle for transformation, it will remain um, a blockage. It will actually remain as a means of holding back the, uh, the struggle. In uh, following sessions, I'm sure comrades will debate the nature of such a party. Indeed, that's one of the, the important themes. But I think um, if I return to uh, one of the opening questions I had on, on the issue of revolutionary consciousness, what we are, I think, seeking to do is to pick up on the debates that occurred in both the second and the third international and apply the lessons of, of those, uh, those movements to our current period. That's not simply because we're antiquarians and we enjoy looking through old texts. It's because in many ways, the questions that uh, uh, our fore, forebears faced in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I think have been thrown up again. We can, we can talk about all sorts of historical analogies. We can talk about all sorts of similarities. But the fact is that, that, that the forces of revolutionary Marxism and of those comrades who claim to be revolutionary Marxists have been thrown back immeasurably over the last 30 or 40 years. And so I think we have to look at how we can rebuild those forces. Now, 
the, the orientation to the Labour Party as a united front uh, is, is obviously one area, but above all, the creation of a communist party that aims uh, for hegemony in the working class movement is, is really the essential question. We cannot have one without the other. And that's because the Communist Party is able to put forward a clear Marxist program of revolutionary transformation. It points out very clearly the nature of labor and laborism. It critiques that, it critiques both the labor left. In many ways, its critique of the labor left has to be sharper because these are uh, influential um, people. They're influential in the working class movement. Above all, they're influential in persuading people that parliamentary socialism, that reformism can achieve uh, the goals of the working class movement. Um, and so our critiques there are critiques also of their failures to take on the right wing. Our critiques of Corbyn have to be sharper, I think, than those of, of Starmer. Um, Starmer is an, an out and out, an open pro-capitalist politician. We can e expose him and reveal that, but it's, it's the role of, uh, of the left reformist that I think is, um, you know, is an important aspect of our work. But above all, the importance of a party rather than just a, a current within the Labour Party. And that, I suppose, raises the question of, of how the workers' movement moves from forms of spontaneity, moves from forms of, of reformism, and essentially working within the confines of a capitalist parliamentary and constitutional order, how that consciousness is developed. And that does require a party, and it does require a very clear program that breaks with capitalism. That isn't, I think, something that a, a tendency or a current can, can, actually, uh, can actually achieve. So the struggle uh, to transform Labour into a united front and uh, the building of a communist party are in effect inextricably linked. We cannot have one without the other. And one of the problems of existing left currents that operate within Labour is, is even those which have uh, ostensibly Marxism and the socialist transformation of society inscribed on their banner, still don't pose that question of the party and therefore consequently the real question of power uh, in society. They still uh, see Labour as a, a, and still claim Labour is, is an instrument that requires, uh, you know, uh, some, some tinkering, maybe some major reforms, but they do not really call for its transformation. And that is where, where our demands have now become really central in that struggle. So comrades, uh, I, that's my introduction, and uh, I'll leave, leave, it to, uh, leave it to the meeting to um, take it up.